Aloha. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. Um, hi, my name's Emma Garish, and I'm from Powilo on the Hamakua Coast. And I'm here tonight because of the Trump regime and the threat that it poses. In Hawaii, we're the bluest state in the nation. We're the most progressive state, and we rejected Trump by the largest margins. And so I want to know that Tulsi Gabbard, our representative, is fighting for those progressive values and that she understands that we do not want anything that the Trump agenda wants. So that's why I'm here. And if I get a chance to ask her a question, I'd like to ask her about um, refugees, particularly the Syrian refugees, because I know she doesn't support military um, intervention in Syria. But regardless of what happens, you know, the people in Syria are suffering so much. And I believe it's our humanitarian duty to welcome as many refugees into the country as possible. And so I'm curious to hear what her position on that is. Will she support increasing the U.S.'s refugee quota? And will she support um, resettlement efforts for Syrian refugees and refugees from other war-torn areas in the U.S.? I am Abraham Tabeh, and I've been living on the island for about six and a half years, from Iran originally, and on the, in the United States for about four decades. And my question is that uh, for six months, uh, I have now been living at a Section 8, hot Section 8. And uh, my question is that, unfortunately, uh, the county housing, as well as HUD, are under the literally control of the police department. And that's really not right. Uh, and that's really my question. Should that, should that be the case? Because I've been running to him, I've been profiled, and the police is negatively influencing our program, which should not be. Is that correct? Is that how it should be? Aloha, Mrs. Gabbard. My, Aloha. Name, is, my name is Travis Rogers. Um, I am a, a representative of the disabled community on the island, and particularly I want to ask questions about the mental health services. Mental health is an issue that every family deals with, every community deals with. It is also a part of health treatment that is neglected. Um, often people with mental health problems do not get the treatment that they need, do not get the medicines that they need, and this leads them to acting out in ways that puts them in prison and people are languishing in prison simply because they did not get the mental health treatment that they needed when they needed it. How can we better serve the mental health treatment community, the people who need help, the doctors who provide the help, uh, the doctors who prescribe the medicine, and access to more affordable medicine and more availability of treatment in a plethora of illnesses, not just depression and anxiety? Yeah. Thank you for your question. And Thank you for representing the voice of so many. There's a number of actions that have to be taken. At the federal level, we've got to look at uh, ways to be able to open up and provide and empower those who can provide that support and that care. We've got to look at how we can provide better federal funding and access. But I think overall, you've, you've raised an important issue, which is, just raising awareness and understanding around mental health care uh, and challenges and who is affected and what needs to be done as a result. Uh, I can relate in a small way through uh, many of my fellow veterans, friends who I've served with, who have come home from having served in our country's wars, uh, physically seeming to be just the same as they were before they left, but carrying invisible wounds that um, don't go away very quickly, if ever. And the stigma that they are experiencing uh, is one that I'm seeing you nodding your head that you can relate to. Uh, the stigma of, you know, for, for some of my veteran friends, of being afraid or unwilling to even ask for help of being labeled as less than or damaged in some way and therefore not getting access to the care that they, they so desperately need. 
in large part, many of this leads to the 22 veteran suicides that we see every single day across this country. The seriousness of this issue uh, is, is great. Uh, there is some legislation that, that if we get your name and number, we can send you some details about that helped to um, provide better resources, that helped to fund uh, more beds for those who need care. Uh, but I'm glad you brought up the criminal justice impact on our criminal justice system because it is not often talked about. Uh, yet this is one of the, the consequences of not addressing this issue uh, at the root and thinking that somehow putting a Band-Aid over it is going to solve something when it only makes the problem worse. Thank you. Okay, our next question is gonna be from James Pihana. James, if you could raise your hand, please. There he is. And as we get the mic to you, what is your stand on Native Hawaiian rights? And based on your stand, what actions do you plan to take or legislation that you support regarding Native Hawaiian rights? Good question. Give a pause. <laughs> um, you know, this has been, I, I worked for Senator Akaka in Washington as a staffer a few years back. It was actually between both of my deployments with the Hawaii Army National Guard. And, you know, he's he's been and continues to be one of our great champions for the Native Hawaiian community. And one thing that I saw back then that was so frustrating and is unfortunately continues through today is such a, a, an ignorance and lack of understanding in Washington about our Native Hawaiian community. People in Washington who flatly deny that we have indigenous people here in Hawaii. I'm not joking, really. If you look at, I mean, history and if you look at uh, all, the, all, you know, you, you can provide this information, but too many people uh, choose not to be open-minded and choose not to accept it. So this is the challenge that we deal with and that I've, you know, since uh, I first got elected in passing, for example, the reauthorization of the Native Hawaiian Education Act. Uh, Native Hawaiians, unlike unlike Alaska Natives and um, uh, Native Americans are not federally recognized. Uh, therefore, those in Congress question, why should we have special programs for Native Hawaiians? Native Hawaiian education, housing, healthcare, three of the major federal areas uh, that we provide support to preserve and perpetuate uh, Native Hawaiian culture and people within our communities. Uh, there are over 200 places in federal law that Native Hawaiians are referenced, yet this battle is something that we continue every single year. So just briefly, I'll tell you, the Native Hawaiian Education Reauthorization Act, this was a, a, an act that both Senator Kaka and Senator Inouye put in place decades ago, had continued, and they continued to get it reauthorized and funded, and just recently, uh, it faced uh, expiration, it needed reauthorization again. So we worked to, to prepare the legislation to reauthorize this bill, and we were told left and right, look, the political climate will not allow this to happen. And people were, we were very concerned, because you take away this Native Hawaiian Education Act, you take away funding for a lot of our immersion schools, you take away a lot of funding for the, the, Hawaii, the Olelo program that we heard uh, from the kids here uh, earlier this evening. Uh, you take away a lot of the funding that allows for our kupuna to go and teach our keiki uh, about culture, about tradition, history, and the future, and that they are the future. So we worked to get this legislation to be included as part of a, a larger education bill that Congress is one of these must-pass bills. Uh, it was a bipartisan bill. But even, and we worked with our Alaska Republican counterpart uh, to help get this to the floor, the relationships that I was able to establish early on uh, allowed for the opportunity and the openness to be able to have this conversation with my Republican colleagues. That when they saw my amendment come to the floor, there were some groups, activist groups, that started sending messages to Republicans saying, vote against this. This is a racist amendment. This is a bad bill. And rather than accepting that on face value, 
I started getting phone calls and text messages saying, hey, Tulsi, tell us why you're pushing this amendment. Tell us why it's important to your constituents in Hawaii. And I was able to make that case. Uh, and thankfully, we were able to pass that, and that bill was reauthorized. So even with so many of the challenges that we face, this is what I and my team try to do our best with every single day that we are working in Washington, is to be inspired by the Aloha spirit here at home, to not be consumed by the divisiveness uh, that is in Washington, and to recognize and actively seek out those opportunities to work in a bipartisan way, to be able to actually inform people, bring people together around things that will help our community, that will help our people, and actually get those things done. Uh, and that's what we've got to be able to continue to do, both in Washington and in our communities here at home. Aloha, uh, Tulsi, Aloha. how are you doing? I'm great, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. All I've right. Been a while. Yeah. I just admire your spunk and your bravery. Uh, going out to Syria and letting all the people of this uh, area know that you're doing your work uh, and you're a very brave person. Thank you. As a combat wounded veteran myself, I commend you for your bravery. Thank you for your service. It takes a lot of guts to get out there and face your enemy sometimes. And it takes somebody like you to get out there and bring awareness to everyone back home that you're trying to protect these islands also. I know you're pretty aware of what's going on currently around the world. But what my question was for you tonight is that we have a lot of veterans out there that are homeless. Yeah. When I got back from Vietnam, it was, a, it was pretty hard going through and finding out who I really was after settling back down. They didn't deprogram us. We had a problem with PTSD and a lot of problems with uh, Agent Orange and stuff like this. They were facing uh, job opportunities and uh, health and stuff like this that you got on your agenda today. So I'm just glad. It took me 40 years to get my 100%, but I got it. Keeping a good straight record and being honorable in everything you do also gives me good credibility to afford a home today. So, I know that homeless, when I was growing up, there was no such person as a homeless person. So, you know, I just want to say, those people out there that are homeless, get off your feet and do something about it. Go back to school. Find out who you really are. Check in with your doctors or your, your community leaders and get help. Because I had to do the same thing. It's a hard struggle, but we're all aware we have a major problem with homeless here on the islands. Yeah. And one of it, of course, is housing. Yeah. And I know that's how I know your top priorities is too. But it's good to see you again. I'm Mahalo. glad you're doing a great job out there. Keep up the good work. Mahalo, Uncle. Mahalo. Thank you for, for bringing up an important issue and for sharing your aloha with me. Uh, I appreciate your service and, and your standing up and speaking for so many of our brothers and sisters who've worn the uniform and who are home facing challenges today. Uh, one of the things that I learned a lot about uh, in 2012 as I was traveling through uh, throughout Hawaii Island meeting with different veterans was an issue um, someone spoke to me about this once I walked in here tonight, but the issue that uh, VA home loans, which is a benefit that veterans earn, were not being approved for Hawaii Island veterans because of water catchment. That water catchment systems were not being approved by the Department of Health and therefore were not being approved by the big VA home loans. I couldn't believe this when I learned it, that veterans on Hawaii Island were essentially being discriminated against because of the way this island works. <laughs> so we worked very hard and it took several months, uh, but within that first year, we were able to get the VA to the table, we were able to get State Department of Health to the table, 
and we're able to work out a compromise that now allows veterans on Hawaii Island to access the VA home loan guarantee that they've earned. And all of you know, with our high cost of living here in Hawaii, uh, the idea of home ownership is out of reach for far too many people. So to be able to open those doors for our veterans, to be able to uh, achieve that home ownership uh, is, is an important thing to address the homelessness, the high cost of living, and these other issues that you talked about, and to make sure that veterans can access the benefits that you've earned. Mahalo. Your next question is from Jesus Del Mar. Jesus, can you raise your hand, please? Yes, the mic is making to you. Is there a plan to become more food self-sufficient when so much food is imported? What can we do to push forward? I just had a few meetings on this earlier today. This is, um, this is an issue that I have been and am working on to see how at the federal level we can better support those who are on the ground here working towards food security, sustainability, energy security. Because food and energy, those are the two things that we import the most uh, and that we end up paying so much for here in Hawaii. Uh, when you look at what happens when the ports shut down, everything gets real, really quick, about how handicapped we are and have frankly allowed ourselves to become here in Hawaii. Uh, there needs to be a coordinated effort between those in the agriculture community, the county, the state, and us at the federal level to work together towards uh, this goal of true food security and sustainability. Because right now, we find ourselves in kind of an ad hoc situation where there are some people doing some amazing things. We see people and leaders in certain communities stepping up to the plate saying, all right, here's what we're gonna do for our community, which is phenomenal. But this has to be something that is economically viable, it has to be an economically viable um, possibility for those who are thinking, all right, do I wanna go and you know, farm the land like my father or my parents and their parents and their parents have done? Or do I wanna go get a job working nine to five somewhere where I'm guaranteed a paycheck every day? So um, there's not an easy answer to this question, but it is an urgent question uh, that we all need to work together towards. You know, the, the governor recently talked about increasing local food production by 50% by 2020, which is a great goal, but I've been asking around to farmers and, and folks who've been studying this issue for a long time is where are we now? If we need to increase by 50%, let's look at the metrics of where we are now. How much food are we actually producing for our people today? And I haven't been able to get a straight answer, not because people don't want to give one, but because different people have different definitions of, well, what is food? <laughs> what I like to eat might be different from what you like to eat. <laughs> I might not think your food is good for, for me. Uh, but there's the, the fact that there's not a baseline of metrics to say, okay, we're here, we need to get here by this date, and then, of course, if once you do that, then you say, okay, what's the strategy to get there? What are the programs that we're gonna put in place to do that? Uh, I was on Lanai the other night, and there's a, a small farmer there who's gung-ho, and he's, he's, I don't know, he's probably around 60 years old, but he's fired up about um, continuing and growing the small farming community on Lanai. But he says, we don't have a processing plant that we can all use and share as a community. Uh, so, you know, people in, in communities are identifying the needs, they have the desire and the motivation, but we've got to have that, that coordinated strategy in place to be able to achieve that necessary goal of true food security for our state. Aloha. I salute you um, as one veteran to another. I salute for your service and service to your country and being our congresswoman. Thank you um, for your service. There's two topics I want to bring tonight, and, and it's really um, real quick. The first one is important to me because there was a bill that came out 
that's sponsored by you and Senator uh, Hirono. And what the bill was about the uh, Congressional Gold Medal for World War II Filipino veterans. And maybe later afterwards, I can show you all my father's medals with his Purple Heart. To make a uh, brief history of my father, my, my parents were uh, in the Philippines in the war, before the war, during the war, and after the war. But see, my father served in the U.S. Army, and he was General MacArthur's bodyguard. He was a POW. Um, he survived the death march, the Bataan death march, and he helped John MacArthur form the guerrilla forces in the Philippines and await his return. So my question is, was because I have the article that came out back in December in our local paper, and it didn't mention if um, the Filipino veterans um, that is this award or medal given to people that are still alive or people like my dad who is deceased. And the second topic I want to mention is that I serve, my family serve every branch of the service as veterans, okay? I served in Korea in the early, in the 70s. And I know how the North Koreans are. Because I served at the DMZ side by side with the ROC armed forces and our forces. And to tell you the truth, if I was to give you guys uh, information how sensitive the North Koreans are, anything will touch them off, anything. Okay, you spit on the ground, they'll shoot you. You take their picture, they'll shoot you, okay? Stuff like that. So what I'm saying is that we should not provoke the North Korean leader because I have firsthand experience by serving there, and I know how they are. Um, we are prepared, our forces are prepared with the Iraq Army, um, ROK, which is uh, Republic of Korea Armed Forces. We're all prepared to do whatever we have to do, but all I'm saying tonight is that we should not provoke the North Korean leader because that's what they train for. They train for war. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address both of your questions because they are both important. Uh, thank you to you and your father and your family who have sacrificed so much. Uh, he referenced the Congressional Gold Medal being awarded to Filipino World War II veterans. Uh, this was legislation that Senator Maisie Hirono introduced in the Senate and that I introduced in the House to provide long overdue recognition to people who served alongside, shoulder to shoulder, with American service members uh, and who still to this day have not gotten the recognition that they earned. Uh, in fact, they were promised recognition by our government so long ago and very quickly uh, after the war was over, our federal government reneged on the deal, on their promises and broke them completely, taking away that recognition for these brave heroes. So we got over 300 co-sponsors in the House uh, for this bill before it passed, uh, and Senator Hirono got over three quarters of the Senate to support her bill uh, as well. Uh, the bill doesn't speak to your question about uh, providing the award. Right now, I think there's about 18,000 Filipino World War II veterans still alive in the world. Um, and so we're working on, a few people have asked that same question, can we provide it also to the families of those who have already passed? So if you make sure we get your information, we'll follow up with you on that. Uh, on the second issue of North Korea, you're, you're uh, exactly right about what the consequences of provocation are. Uh, and you know, some people make the mistake of saying, well, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, he's a lunatic, he's crazy, but I have heard from many experts, and when you look at the situation, um, and you, you realize, well, his actions follow a certain form of logic. And it speaks back to this common thread that's come up throughout the night about regime change war. North Korea has nuclear weapons as a deterrent to regime change. That is why they refuse to let go of their nuclear weapons. 
And when they look at what we did in Libya with Gaddafi, when an agreement was made, say, okay, you denuclearize, we're not gonna come after you, we're gonna allow you to remain in power. And then very soon after we came in, launched another regime change war, toppled him, he was dragged through the street. North Korea is watching this saying, okay, why should we trust anything when our country has this track record of regime change? So again, our policies have consequences. So now that we here in Hawaii are staring down the barrel essentially of a nuclear threat from North Korea, um, we've got to think through clearly and understand exactly uh, what's going on here. Uh, that it's not just a lone actor, but there are again consequences to our policies uh, in the past and the policies that, that we are still playing out today in Syria, that we are still seeing play out today in Syria. Your next question from the floor is from Sarah Carr. Sarah, if you could raise your hand. Yes, yeah, they bring the mic to you, the question on uh, submitted written. Doesn't it bother you that Steve Bannon and some white supremacists like you? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't make my decisions on policies based on uh, who agrees with me or who disagrees with me or who likes me, who doesn't like me. Uh, what party they may be a part of, or anything else. And frankly, the premise of the question is such that it, it creates a situation where I would be in a position of saying, okay, well, if David Duke or white supremacists are against regime change wars, maybe I should be for them. If they are for protecting our environment, maybe I should be against protecting our environment. It's just a ridiculous uh, way to look at things and it undermines the seriousness of these issues that we're facing. And unfortunately, this is a symptom of the climate that we see too often in Washington where a good bill a good amendment, piece, a, a good piece of legislation comes to the floor and immediately, rather than actually reading it and saying, okay, does this help people or does it hurt people? Rather than actually reading it, immediately there are people on both sides who say, oh, that's a Republican bill, I'm gonna vote against it. It's a Democrat bill, I'm gonna vote against it. How does that allow for progress? How does that allow for debate? How does that allow for us to do our jobs in serving you? So too many people are quick to, to look at these superficial issues which undermine, again, the seriousness of what we are actually facing and the real work that needs to be done. And this is our challenge and our opportunity, frankly. We come from the Aloha State. We have the opportunity, and I would say even the responsibility, to carry that Aloha in what we do, in the conversations that we have, in the relationships that we have both in Washington as well as here in our community at home, so that we can be solutions oriented, so that we can focus on service, focus on doing good, and fighting against things that are not. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Hi. Aloha. Um, thanks for everything you're doing in Washington. And my question is about North Korea. I know you've already answered or spoken to this a lot. But I was just wondering, what is the level of threat that we're currently under? And I guess what always gets to me the most, this goes back to what you're saying in the beginning, is that every time I turn on the international news or the national news, it's always, does Kim Jong-un have a ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missile capable of hitting New York? or capable of hitting California. I've been hearing that for like three years. Every time I turn on the news, can he hit New York? We're not, you know, we're over here. So, um, and you know, he's made his hatred of the US and this, he just his will to target us quite clear. And so I guess my question is, what do we do? What's being done about it? And what's being done specifically to protect Hawaii? I mean, should I be building a bomb shelter or? 
like buying gas masks and uh, that, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Every single time we discuss the issue of North Korea in either of the committees that I'm on, my opening line generally is, I represent Hawaii's second congressional district and North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missiles can hit Hawaii. So the, the, the question is not a, it's not a theoretical question, it is a reality that people here in our state, people here in my district experience and understand and take seriously. Uh, slowly, slowly people are starting to hear and starting to pay a little bit more attention, uh, but uh, this is something that I'm continuing to, to push back very strongly against to educate our decision makers about the fact that we've got the 50th state out here um, that is already within range. Uh, there are a number of things that, that can and should be done. Uh, we've passed stronger sanctions bills against North, the, the North Korean regime, the elites in particular. Uh, but the challenge is that many of these sanctions bills, even passed by Congress, uh, have not been truly enforced. Or if they have, they've only been enforced for a, a small window of time so that once you actually start seeing uh, an impact in curbing the escalation, and curbing the actions of the North Korean leadership, the sanctions were lifted prematurely. Uh, so that's, that's one uh, area that needs to be fully um, executed. Uh, China has a very critical role to play in this, uh, given the fact that much of North Korea, the North Korean regime's economy uh, comes still through China and their borders uh, and banks associated with China. Uh, so there's a f there are other diplomatic means that need to be um, pushed through in order to try to deal with this threat. Meanwhile, here in Hawaii, what can we do? What should we do? Um, through my work on the committees, we've already started last year to get legislation passed, uh, and we are working uh, urgently now to make sure that we have a defensive system in place for Hawaii. Um, it's not to say that we will have an ironclad shield of protection, but we need to have a, a, a strong missile defense capability here in Hawaii. Uh, the, the mainland, they've got a number of systems in place to protect the mainland. We've got to make sure that we have one specifically for Hawaii that could shoot down a missile uh, should it come our way. Hawaii, right now on Kauai, her question is, do we have that capability today? Hawaii does not have the capability today to shoot down a defensive missile that could um, intercept one coming towards us. There are others on the mainland that do have that capability to protect Hawaii, but I am pushing for Hawaii to have that capability ourselves. On, without getting into too much of the details of, of, of how all these systems work, uh, on Kauai at the Pacific Missile Range facility that currently tests a lot of the different types of defensive um, weapon systems that our country has. Um, we are working to basically see what we can do to um, put a defensive system in operational, not a test site, but an operational site uh, for the protection of Hawaii. Thank you. Our next question from the floor will be from Storm Seeger. You could raise your hand in the back. Okay, as we get the mic to you, how can you help us fill in the funding gaps from this administration here in Hawaii? The president's budget that was put forward, I forget what they called it, like the skinny budget or the trim down budget, I forget what they called it, but it had drastic cuts across all the different federal agencies, uh, including Department of Education, the EPA, health, housing and urban development, uh, and many of these cuts, as we learned about them, uh, were objectionable to many Democrats as well as many Republicans. So my hope is that as, you know, every year, every president comes and brings a budget to Congress as a proposal saying, here's what I'd like your budget to look like, but it's actually Congress's role and responsibility to write 
and pass a budget and an appropriations bill. Uh, so that's something that we are going to be continuing to work on. We've already begun the process of laying out our priorities for Hawaii specifically uh, on this in each of the different areas that are funded by the federal government. Uh, and we're going to continue working uh, as this budget process goes through. Um, there, there will have to be a serious conversation depending on what that final budget looks like uh, with folks in the state legislature as we look at next year uh, next year's session to see what areas will actually uh, be impacted to affect that shortfall. But it's, it's going to be tough um, given the fact that we're dealing with a one-party rule in Washington. Uh, so I'm not trying to, um, you know, paint the picture with rose-colored glasses. Congress we, we have an opportunity to try to work in a bipartisan way to build a budget that uh, stunts the, the drastic cuts that the administration has put forward. Um, and folks who come from Hawaii to Washington to talk about direct impacts of the budget here in Hawaii, they have counterparts who are doing the same thing with their members of Congress from other states and other districts, Republican and Democrat. So, you know, the voice of the people really will uh, have a great impact on this because it is the real stories of, of people who are impacted in their own lives by these cuts that can help move uh, people to, to do the right thing. So um, stay tuned on this one. We've got to keep our eye on it and keep working on it. Uh, thank you for being here and taking my question. I'm here representing HighCop.org, which is a grassroots organization trying to reduce tour helicopter noise over our homes. This is a 40-year problem that just keeps getting worse. And we're getting tired of listening to the FAA and the National Park Service saying they really can't do anything about it. Now Hawaii Volcanoes National Park leads the nations in overflights. And to that end, uh, pro Highcop.org proposed an offshore route where the helicopters could go offshore and then come in on the, the ocean side to, into the lava areas where they want to go. And so far, we have not heard any response from the helicopter pilot companies. So my question is to you, can you please encourage them to uh, maybe voluntarily try this one more time, to voluntarily accept that, and failing that, Failing the regulatory, the regulatory agencies have completely failed here, and voluntary agreements have not worked at all. And uh, Congresswoman Patsy Mink had it right in 1993 when H.R. 1696 was proposed to regulate the airspace over the national park. It never made it out of the committee. And my question to you, please, is would you consider reintroducing that bill? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, I know there's a lot of folks here who share your concern about this, uh, and I've spoken with some of your, your local legislators here as well already uh, who are working to try to address this issue. Uh, my chief of staff along with, I know Maisie Hirono's chief of staff, I'm not, I think there may have been the other members of the federal delegation there, uh, had a meeting with National Park Service and FAA um, in particular to talk about this issue, as well as some of the helicopter companies. And this, uh, Senator Kai Kahele has been very outspoken on this, as well as others here uh, on Hawaii Island. You're right, there were no answers given at that meeting, uh, just a lot of problems and challenges and obstacles. Uh, but we have to find a way to work through this. I know that one of the pushbacks that was given of the, um, flights over the ocean uh, is that only one company, I believe Blue Hawaii, has the required safety equipment to land on water in an emergency and the other companies do not. So I can imagine they would probably uh, be opposed to that idea. But regardless, there has to be a workable solution brought forward for the community here. Uh, and one thing that's been uh, a proposed idea that I think makes sense is for the FAA to appoint a local task force leader to address and be the point person on this issue uh, to, to be that conduit between the companies, uh, the helicopter companies, the community, the National Park Service, as well as the local elected officials to find a solution. 
because the status quo clearly has been uh, going on for, for far too long and has gotten out of hand. So we're going to continue to work and engage on this issue. Uh, we have been uh, in touch now for, for the last uh, several months when some folks came and approached me directly to say, hey, we need, you to, we need you to get on board with this. And so we're going to continue that engagement and look forward to working with you folks in that. Thank you. Your next question is from Shannon Matson. You raise your hand, please. Oh, back. And in the meantime, what is the status of the Stop Arming Terrorist Act? Thank you for asking that question. I spoke about this bill um, a little bit earlier and what it does. Uh, we need more co-sponsors. Is really the bottom line. Uh, I need your help in calling our Hawaii delegation to get them onto the bill. It is a bipartisan bill now. We have some of the most progressive Democrats in the House, as well as some of the most conservative Republicans, both signed onto this bill. Another bipartisan opportunity. We've got Senator Rand Paul in the Senate who recently introduced the exact legislation in the Senate, so we need to get our senators on board. Uh, Really, this comes down to informing people and, and raising the awareness about what our country has been doing for all these years. And I'll just mention quickly, I know we're going to wrap up soon, but uh, this bill addresses uh, generally our country's policies, uh, but also specifically the situation in Syria. That There are two wars that are happening there and have been going, that, that our country has been waging now for quite some time. Uh, the first war is uh, this war that I've talked about, this illegal counterproductive regime change war that needs to end, that has cost so many lives, created refugees, and caused such devastation, and actually strengthened these terrorist groups. And the second war is counterproductive, to, is, is diametrically opposed to that war because it's the war to defeat terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, who have such strongholds in Syria. These are terrorist groups. Al-Qaeda attacked us on 9-11. ISIS continues to pose a threat to us. This is a war that we've got to win. Uh, so we need to get our uh, legislators and lawmakers understanding the reality of the situation there to sign on to the Stop Arming Terrorist Bill so that we stop fueling this regime change war in Syria. And let's get serious about taking those dollars, those billions and billions of dollars we've spent there in Syria alone, reinvesting in those dollars in our community right here at home. Because we can't afford to do both. Congresswoman, um, I, I just Where wanna, I'm over here. Oh, hi, hi. okay, thank you. Hi. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I've emailed you. I've called. I've met with a lot of your representatives here, and I really appreciate this. I know we're almost out of time, but this is a really important question to me. Um, and you said earlier, our actions have led to unintentional human suffering when referencing war. And you've talked about that a couple of times. And I would really like to talk about where your actions have led to what I believe was unintentional human suffering. Um, and that's in regards to Bill 54 when you were on the county council in Honolulu. And um, so that was back in 2011. And I think if you fully understood the results of that bill, and for those of you who don't know about that, that was a, a, house, a homeless uh, criminalization bill taking people's personal possessions and throwing them away and we've seen the results and that this is not effective. It's not a compassionate solution to work with our most vulnerable population, which is mostly, not mostly, but largely made up of, um, of veterans, which I know you work hard for, and um, Native Hawaiian population. And so I'm just wondering what you'd be willing to do to kind of step up and ho'oponopono with some of the um, homeless advocates and I know you've done some incredible things for the homeless population since this original bill, but we keep expanding, or Honolulu in particular keeps expanding the sit-lie bans, which have been proven by UH study to not be effective. And I just want to know going forward what compassionate solutions you have to continue to help the homeless population, because 
a lot of us in this room are maybe just a few paychecks away from being in that same situation and to have their only personal possessions thrown away um, or put away and then they have to pay a fine that they can't possibly pay to get those possessions back. Uh, it just seems so counter to what you usually stand for. And I'm proud to wear your shirt. I'm proud to vote for you. I'm proud to sign wave for you. I'm really proud to have you as my representative. But I just don't understand how you could have um, enacted such a bill and supported such a bill and why you won't speak out against it now with this platform that you have. Thank you. Thank you. you know, during my time uh, as a member of the Honolulu City Council, I represented an urban part of Honolulu. And this bill came about out of uh, a concern for safety that I received predominantly from a lot of uh, elderly and disabled within our community, that they were finding it a safety hazard to be able to go, uh, that they were unable to go through public walkways, sidewalks, and thoroughfares uh, because of people who had either set up tents or who had their belongings that were blocking that public thoroughfare. Uh, so the bill did provide for uh, the warn a warning system to be in place. It was not um, it, it was not to just go in and immediately grab people's belongings, but it was a, a bill that was introduced and passed to address the safety hazard in public thoroughfares specifically. Uh, what can we do and what uh, are we doing? Uh, at the federal level, we have and continue to try to pass uh, specific housing uh, programs to be able to help get those who are houseless or homeless off of the streets, to be able to help provide funding for those who are working through transitions, uh, and also understand and recognize the complexities of which we're dealing with here that is not um, easily addressed just with one. Mental health challenges is one issue, making sure that those services are there and available to be provided. Substance abuse is another issue, helping to make sure that those services uh, are there. Uh, and then there are those who um, need that transitional help to be able to, maybe they're working a full-time job and they can't make that first rent paycheck. So we've got to be holistic in our uh, addressing this issue and actually getting to um, the root cause of it in a way that will help people uh, empower themselves and, and get their lives back to where they want them to be. And that's something that I will continue to do, uh, both at the federal level and looking to see how I can support those who are working hard here uh, at the local level. Okay, we're going to take one last question from the floor, and that's from Margaret Willey. Margaret? And as you get the mic, a couple of things. Again, we apologize if we didn't get to everyone's question, but rest assured, if you filled out one of the cards and your email is on there, staff will be getting back with a response for you. And from after Margaret's question, I'd like to turn it back over to Representative Gabbard to give some closing remarks. Um, hi, Tulsi. Aloha, Margaret. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for directing us to that it's not only on the national level, it's on the state and local level. And there's a great deal that we have an opportunity to do right now in this state legislature and where they ignore a lot of our Democratic Party priorities, and we all need to work on that. Um, my question for you is what more can we do to support you in terms of being an independent, fearless voice, whether that's on issues or Democratic Party, you know, national people in Washington where they're saying, well, she may be supported back in Hawaii, but here in Washington now she's going downhill, you know, that, that. But what can we do just so that you stay strong and we help to empower you and your independence, whether we agree with every vote you make or whether we um, sometimes disagree, but that we believe in you and want to help you. Thank you, Margaret. That's, thank you. Those guys in Washington have no idea what Hawaii is about and who is Hawaii. And I'm glad that I fit in here and not there.
you know, you, you, you said a few things, Margaret. Um, how you can support me is just by continuing to support uh, the work, whether it's issues at the federal level or, as you mentioned, issues here at the local level. The best way that we can help each other, the best way that we can help our community uh, is by taking action, by being involved, being engaged on these issues that are so important to all of us, to our today and for our future. Uh, we can't afford to be complacent. Too many folks still stay home on election day because they don't feel like their vote makes a difference. <laughs> Elections have consequences. Still strong, Auntie. I'm still taking care of my grandkids, and I'm still teaching them to love our country. Thank you. Thank you and your husband for your service, your ohana. Um, if you see one of my staff here before you leave tonight, we can try to help work with you and the, to get to the VA to address some of the issues that you raised, uh, because you, you clearly... Um, have, have earned and deserved those, those benefits. So thank you very much and thanks for coming this evening. And, and with that, I'll just say in closing, um, thank you all for taking the time to come out this evening. Uh, it is wonderful to be home and to be with so many people who are truly living aloha. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. Thank you that we can work together to actually make progress for all of Hawaii. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for you. I'm grateful to serve you and work for you in Washington. Mahalo. Thank you.